So here we are, we're with Clint Adams, who's the author of the book, Lightning the Blue Flame. Um, bit of a funny story, Clint and I had a very long conversation a couple of weeks ago. Uh, we thought we were being recorded, but when you bring two digital dinosaurs together, um, <laughs> it doesn't necessarily go well. So this is take two, um, but it was an enjoyable conversation. So um, I'm excited to chat about it again. Um, so first of all, Clint, um, amongst all this chaos that we're going through in the world at the moment, thanks for taking the time to uh, talk to me about um, something that you're really passionate about, but is a really important message. Um, actually, probably even become more relevant despite the what's going on at the moment, interestingly. So we're looking forward to digging into that. Um, because you've got such an interesting and diverse background, I think it's always nice to know the man behind the book. Uh, maybe if you could talk a little bit about bit about your background and how you've got to this point, both both uh, professionally and uh, personally as well. Well, first, thanks for having me. I know last time I didn't actually have a physical copy <laughs> of the book, so this is your copy, so I'll be sending that Thank over you. the uh, the river to you um, when I get to the uh, post office. So, look, uh, I guess, yeah, my background, I've always been interested in, in psychology and, and, uh, and I guess I've always been drawn to roles that around helping people. I obviously became a police officer, but I originally studied my psych degree uh, and pharmacology, psych and pharma were the two things that I was, uh, my majors, with, with the intent of, of I guess, uh, going into more of a forensic psychology component, working with the police. Back then in the 90s, <laughs> showing my age, but in the 90s, um, it was still part of the police uh, unit, so to speak. And you had to become a senior constable to, to be able to go into those kind of squads. And that was kind of my aspiration at that stage. As luck would have it, um, that didn't pan out. I, um, I became a senior constable, but they actually privatised that part of the organisation and it went to a place called McLeod. So it was pretty much independent from the police force itself. So for me to go down that path, I'd have to become a psychologist and then... Um, try and get in that way. So I didn't do that. I decided I was also then interested still in doing counselling, true counselling um, work with people. And I ended up doing a, um, a counselling uh, postgrad with Sydney Uni at the time. They were the only ones that did it in Australia back then. There's a lot more to do it now, but back then they were the only ones that did it. So I kind of had to juggle, um, you know, working and, and flying to Sydney and doing practicals and all that kind of stuff. So I, I completed that and I, I kind of tested, I wanted to get into kind of an injury management true counselling kind of role. So I started kind of looking around and I, um, I applied for a role that I kind of didn't think I'd get. It was more around testing whether or you know, what kind of questions they'd ask me and that kind of stuff. And as it turned out, I ended up getting the job and I had to make a decision to stay with the police and, and pursue a different kind of police role, you know, long term, or do I leave? And anyway, I grappled with that for a little while, but then I decided, look, you know, I'll, I'll go down the counselling path. So I worked with a company called Combrook, or they changed their name later to Recover, which I think still exists as Recover now. Um, and they were pretty much a private injury management company, working with people with, you know, lots of injuries, physical injuries, but I, I was dealing with the psych side of it. And I was also doing a lot of work around, um, you know, getting people back into jobs who have been injured and all that kind of stuff. So um, I did that for a, about a year and a half with them, uh, nearly two years, and then I was finding that because I was an ex-cop, uh, a lot of the police people were coming through Recover and uh, they were asking for me to be their person that they, because, you know, I kind of understood a bit more about that. Some of them I knew personally and, and they felt comfortable enough to work with me. So I was getting requested to do lots and lots of police work. Um, so then what happened, the police being who they were, they decided uh, let's make clean an offer and get him to come and do this stuff for them full time and, and bring the whole operation in-house. So I kind of got involved in working with doing that, setting that up. They hadn't actually had a person do that before. Pr prior to that, it was always using f firms like Recover and stuff. So basically set that up, worked um, doing kind of OCK health and safety, a combination of both kind of things because they're all fairly new back then. Um, not many were doing those things and they were slowly starting to get more into it and workers' comp stuff had changed a lot. So, yeah, then I got into that and then... Over time, I, I won't bore you with details, but I had a couple of different roles within the police. Um, they then moved me into um, into HR, sort of fell into it accidentally where I had an org psych come in and help the whole HR team to um, kind of develop teamwork and stuff. And, and the manager at the time was really struggling with his own kind of issues. So um, I got involved in that. He ended up leaving. I ended up taking over. And then from there, I really got involved in a whole kind of 
HR, but change management space where I was really interested in doing that stuff. And then over the years, I've, I've worked pretty much HR in a number of roles, different companies, you know, worked in timber, steel, co- kind of mostly manufacturing, but I did do um, a couple of years where I was doing work with the asylum seekers over in Nauru. So yeah. flying out of Brisbane, um, going over to Nauru, going over mm-hmm. to Manus Island, um, and that kind of stuff. And then I also then went to Sydney and did the same role with Serco, but that was down at Villawood. And I pretty much looked after um, a few of the other uh, what do you call processing centres yeah. in the other states. And now I'm, I'm still doing group HR, but the, essentially the book, um, you know, it came out of me working in healthcare where I, I was kind of privy to a lot of information about people's health and statistics mm-hmm. and stuff like that. And I was quite alarmed around how many young people, you know, 10 to 12 years old, having so much antidepressants, great amounts of obesity. I mean, you talk to the the nurses that were working there in the community, you know, the the issues that they're coming across, you know, suicides and or attempted suicides, and then they're dealing with the kids Mm -hmm. afterwards in aftercare type stuff. So, yeah, that that kind of got me starting to to work around um, doing a school program at the time. Mm -hmm. I then kind of pitched that through another lady in the education department, and between the two of us, we kind of took it up to the Minister of Education at the time down in Victoria, and, you know, we were kind of looking for funding to, to run it. Um, it didn't happen. They lost the election and it just kind of stalled and I kind of lost a bit of, um, I guess, mojo on doing it because mm. you worked full time and trying to run that. So I didn't do that. But then after a while, I, I kind of went into an idea about writing a story around a child, a person that kills themselves. And then um, essentially I, I'm a character in the book and, and I am helping them do the school program and all the stuff that I was kind of trying to pitch back then. So that kind of how the book evolved and, and that's kind of my career in a nutshell the uh the book is uh obviously starts um the story about josh but it's more than a story it's a it's a resource as well where it's got lots of links and cue codes and with the amount of time and effort you would have had to put into this to actually pull this all together would have been quite astronomical and um i'm curious if um while you were alarmed you now some of the stats and information you're getting you know, was there one sort of event or story or person that touched you throughout your career that really solidified that really, you you know, you wanted to write this book and, and pull this all together? Yeah, that was one specific person or event, but I, um, I certainly, one thing changed the course of my career and that was what pushed me to do the counselling proper and, and at the time, like I said, I was grappling with whether I, I moved out of the police and that kind of stuff and that was when when you're in the police, because um, I was in Geelong, it was the police station I worked at, and it was linked to the um, the courthouse right next door. And so what would happen is that when people were coming to be sentenced or they had a case going on, they would basically bring them into our cells and we would look after some people in the cells. And the way they set up is you have a big kind of courtyard and a lot of little cells all off, and you can lock those individually, but during the day the people are in the in that main area and they can kind of exercise and, and yeah. walk around and all that stuff. Having said that, um, obviously there's way more men uh, in those and I there was a lady in our, um, in one of our cells and she was by herself so there was no other women in there and she she was, you know, they can stay anything up to, you know, 28 days depending on the cases and stuff like that. Yeah. So long story short, she was in there for a while. I um, I was looking after the cells. We used to do three months stints in the cells, each, each of us. Um, and it was my turn to be in the cell. So, you know, you come in every day, you kind of see who's in there, you get them fed and they go have their showers and all that kind of stuff. And, and yeah. you, you basically look after them like a, like a jailer would. Yeah. Um, and, you know, so, yeah. So, literally, I, I would, because um, she was by herself, the other people had, the other guys who had other people to talk to and they got a tally and all that kind of stuff. But it's pretty boring, as you can appreciate what I suppose jail isn't supposed to be pleasant. But anyway, um, so I, I kind of just used to talk to her and just ask her stuff. Like she, she so in a nutshell, she was a, uh, a drug addict who'd been stealing a lot of stuff. Um, she'd been caught a few times. She was stealing family stuff, you know, to, to fuel her habit and stuff like that. Um, I found out that she had a very young child. I think from memory, it was about two years old at the time. And anyway, long story short, she was pretty sure she was going to get sentenced this time. She'd had a suspended sentence over her head from the last time. Mm. And so she was pretty much going to get anything up to three years is what mm. kind of she thought. So anyway, we got talking about stuff and I kind of, you know, got kind of involved with um, trying to apply some of the counselling stuff that I'd learned, you know, from Sydney Uni and, and the practical stuff that I was doing and, um, you know, really asked her some some pretty big questions about what she wanted to do, how she wanted to, and, and really get her to focus on 
a future state because obviously she knows she's going to go in prison. Yeah. Can't change the past. I got to really. So it was for me. It was really, um, I guess, testing some of the stuff. It was probably the first time I, you know, dealing with someone who's got some clear issues and um, and how you can work with them. So anyway, I didn't think too much of it. I uh, she ended up getting sentenced. Got about two and a half to three years or whatever it was. And then a few days later, she was obviously taken to the prison where she was going to be kept. And I didn't think too much of it. And about oh, maybe a year later, give or take, um, I was running. I used to have a kind of couple of different ways I'd run um, my normal run days. And this particular day I was, I was running and, and this, someone came running out of the house. I kind of caught him, caught him my eye and sort of waving at me. And uh, it, it ended up being her. She looked a lot healthier. She'd put on a lot more weight. And anyway, she said, look, I'd seen you run past. Obviously, you know, I stand out a little bit. I'm probably not the average looking guy. But, um, so she recognised me and, and said, look, I'd seen you run past a couple of times and I just wanted to stop you and say thank you when, you know, the, the time you spent with me in the cells was um, uh, turned the corner for her. She really mm. didn't focus on doing that stuff. She took it on board and obviously with the drugs coming out of her system, she said, you know, I, I finally had some real clarity and, you yeah. know, the time you spent with me and, and the stuff you talked about really made me focus on that real future state of, of what yeah. can I do, not kind of boggled down by the past and go into a real dark place where she was going. And so, yeah, it was kind of um, a bit of an emotional moment at the time for me. I kind of um, really, you know, realised that, you know, you can can obviously have a big impact on people um, and that's kind of what I I wanted to do. You know, you're helping people and and you can see someone turn their whole life around just from spending a bit of time with them. And and back then I was, you know, quite a novice to all this stuff too, which was um, as much as you read a lot, you know, that practical experience and really seeing that. So that that did make a big difference in um, my career. But then Mm -hmm. it also, when I kind of see, you know, when, when, like I said, with, getting those information on the kids, those kinds of things still bug me in the sense that I'm saying, well, what can I do to help those people? Yeah. You know, we don't want to hear about 11 or 12 year olds on antidepressants or getting yes. that, that kind of stuff. So I guess I've always kind of thought about what else can I do? Yes, yeah. you know, in my normal job at HR, I've got, you know, we've got maybe 2000 employees that work for our yeah. company and I work with other big companies, but you never, you know, I guess you try and see what other things you can do on a bigger scale to help more yeah. people and that kind of stuff. So that's kind of where the book evolved from that school program. Yes. And um, a lot of these concepts, you're dealing with some um, complex neurophysiology that underpins a lot of this stuff. And obviously, you know, throughout the book, you've distilled that down into some, you know, uh, key concepts that are easy to understand that, um, you know, can help you one, even if you're a health professional or a, working the business, um, communicate more effectively, but then also if you're someone on the other side, you, you may be able to understand it. Do you want to talk about a couple of those key concepts that you've really distilled down into a couple of um, really easy ideas? Yeah, look, I, I guess um, me working in, in HR has probably helped a lot with that stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, and more around, I've worked in places where, you know, the higher HR people come up with these ideas and stuff. And, and sometimes it's not practical. They haven't thought it through. They haven't, or sort of haven't, like it's good stuff, but it just doesn't work. And the people yes. that they try and, you know, uh, push it down to on the floor, so to speak, mm. they, they either don't do it or they do a half half ass job of doing it. And so it doesn't kind of do what it needs to do. So whenever I've in, ever done any kind of training and stuff that I develop, I, I really try and think, well, it's got to be practical. There's a lot more psych stuff to your point. I mean, you know, I've read some books that one book took me four years to read was by an awesome psychiatrist, but you know, really good stuff, but so high academic yeah. stuff that it's just not practical for, mm-hmm. for the layman. I don't consider myself a genius or anything, but um, I certainly think, you know, I can read most things, but this was a really hard read because they're writing for, you know, other academics and they are doing their research at that level. And then it's not necessarily practical. So, I kind of go, well, here's this great stuff. It's really complex. How can we make it and use it to develop programs that, A, people can understand, people can put... They don't have to know all the, you know, what's happening with neurotransmitters in your brain and all that stuff. But if you're looking at routines and stuff that does yeah. change that focus, to use that that lady in the in the prisons example, you know, her changing her focus was just using a different part of her brain. Mm. She didn't need to know that you know, the neuropeptides are doing this and the neurons are wiring and firing together. Yes. She just kind of, there was something practical to do yeah. and do it and then things happen for her and all those things are happening kind of unconsciously, if you like. So, yeah, yeah I, I use a lot of um, 
that stuff. And sometimes depending on the audience, like if I'm talking to people that do understand that, I'll, I can ratchet up, I guess, the, the amount of information they want mm. around that. But that's why the book's kind of written that way in the sense that I'll, I'll make it into a certain amount of information. Yes. But then those links will tell you, if you if you really want to go read more about all this stuff, yes. go and read Joe Dispenza's book on, you know, You Are the Placebo or something like that. It's got all that information. Mm. And, um, you know, I, I found it very useful, that book in particular. But, yeah, there's all those links is about how much you want to go. Some people might just read the book straight through and not look at any of the codes. Mm. But that's fine. Um, there's some, you know, music through the book and it's got its own little um, soundtrack. So that's uh, something a little bit different. I, I guess I wanted to make it also... Um, so the story part was also about making it people can identify with various characters in the book, mm. but also understand that, you know, even as a student, you can have an impact yes. on some change and that kind of stuff, which is also an undercurrent part of the book around trying to influence the education system because we, we don't do enough of this stuff um, yeah. from what I've seen yet. I know some things are getting better. I've heard of, you know, they're doing meditation and mindfulness yes. now, but um, we can do a lot better. And, and I think with this kind of, approach um hopefully mm. uh, that gets uh, around well, one of the uh, concepts you talk about is the red and blue brain and um it seems that in part you've been influenced by your past life where in policing things can escalate very quickly into confrontation which then can have really bad outcomes obviously in a workplace and other relationships um, it, it can um, escalate quite quickly but the concept of you know, how you actually get um, people and into a state and a rhythm where they can have some meaningful discussion um, and yeah. resolve something in a, I guess, in, in a manner that's rational. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about through that concept and, and how you've been able to just like practically give people that as a, a tool um, in day-to-day -day life? Yeah, so uh, I guess as I've read and dealt with people and, and also done some other courses along the way, I've seen a common theme in there and the common theme is around our fight or flight part of our natural instincts. We, we're built to have that fight or flight. And I, I refer to that as red brain. So that's when the amygdala's, um, you know, uh, what's the word? Uh, innovated by something, whatever that is. So we either go to the defensive side or we go to the aggressive side. And to your point, you know, like as a cop, you know, as many times you've seen people get angry and then things happen. People get glassed, people get punched. Mm -hmm in back ahead people die and all kinds of things right so that that um that's obviously a spur of the moment kind of thing but also you see these themes that come through with people where you know if they're a very what they think is their personality is quite timid yeah. they get a certain kind of result they tend to be the ones that worry and have high anxieties and mm -hmm. all that kind of stuff and i'm talking about the extreme ends obviously yeah. Um, and then on the other side, you get the people that are so angry, you know, they talk, the old days used to call them the type one person, you know, they're just all aggression. They're full on. Yes, they can get results and stuff, but, you know, they're going to give themselves a peptic ulcer and all that kind of stuff. So um, you see these themes come out, not just in people's health, but then I'm, I'm accredited to run something with human synergistics, which is an LSI. I don't know if you're aware of that. Um, but in there, they, they have information of, you know, um, lots of managers all around the world and they do these surveys. And, and profiles and in a nutshell the most the top 10 percent of companies the profile they have is one where they're not very high in the red brain space they're not highly mm -hmm. aggressive and they're not highly timid but they have a whole more holistic approach and that same thing comes through what i found is the managers with that super red you know the real angry ones they tend to be very uh focused on task yes. um, and they tend to have problems with, with the relationship side of people and, you know, they get staff turnover, people just comply rather than actually wanting to work for them and, mm. and better. So you see that, you know, how you hold yourself and how you uh, can keep that red brain in check, whether mm. it's aggressive or, or defensive, uh, is an important part of, of your own growth. And then also how you then impact other people is, is a massive part of it. So would you say that one of the first parts of the step is just obviously knowing thyself and that self-awareness and making people aware of it is actually the first step to actually then improving the relationship and their response to, I guess, some sort of stress or a response um, that they normally would act in a certain way? Yeah, look, I, th I think um, we don't often sit and think about our thoughts. Like, mm. why, do, why am I the way Clint Adams is? Why do I do this stuff? Like, I, I, I certainly, sometimes I catch myself um, doing things like, um, and, and I've probably picked it up from my parents. A classic example is my, my parents hate organising anything. So, yes. oh, you know, they want to go to South Africa. Oh, Clint, can you can you book my flights? I'm like, you know, you're not 
um, incapable. Yes. It's a, a thing they have. Um, and I find myself sometimes doing that, so I have to catch myself because my wife has, has a crack of me for it. <laughs> but, um, I've seen them do it. And it's not like you're scared. It's yeah. just, you know, and this is the other part that I, I kind of really focus on when, when through the book is how much your body and how you feel about something yes. affects your decision making. Yes. Like sometimes you go, oh, you know, I, I don't feel right about this, so you just won't do it. And, and th that example is I kind of push myself to go and do that because it's not... Like I, like I say, I'm not scared. I just have this feeling I don't want to do it. And so yeah. um, I kind of catch myself doing some of those things. And we have these habits where we don't know that's our undercurrent of habits of thinking yeah. about life. And so mm. we can, I guess, um, limit our, our experiences by mm. not actually knowing why we feel uneasy about something or, or whatever it is. And so it's about, you know, I know you've had your issue with your swim um, mm. where, you know, you had your, and, and you know, same example, you you didn't just stop and go, right, I'm not doing that anymore. You go, yeah. well, I have to. I have to push yeah. myself past that barrier and stuff. Yeah. So um, I, I can relate to that. I mean, that's a that's a bigger uh, thing, you know, going through 22Ks or whatever you did afterwards. <laughs> it's pretty impressive. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's um, but the thing is, it, it's relative to the individual and, and, that's, uh, and that's the thing as well. It's, I find it's very hard to judge um, how... So how someone might be feeling by the actual task or what they're doing because it's all relative to them. Absolutely. Um, and, that, and that's where um, often um, that skill comes in in trying to, you know, that communication. You might think someone, you know, pre in previous lives, people just label someone soft or not a yep. hard worker or so forth, right? They have these um, ideas, but really they don't know how they're, they're feeling. So then in, um, in practical um terms once you've had these conversations and, you've, uh, and you're working with your managers for example what's the what's the one thing that you see that they can do that really increases their um, effectiveness um, in adopting the concepts and ideas so if you just got them to focus on one thing and only one thing only yep. uh, based on what you've found both practically and from the research what would you say that one thing is i think the key is that trying to when you know when, when people are under the pump which you know yeah. manufacturing especially you know there's that mm. real drive you've got to so people are already kind of on, on a higher alert kind yeah. of stuff um and so it's quick it's easy to trigger stuff and people get angry quicker mm. think, um you know the, the the anger if you can create that space and you know um you know the with what you're thinking or oh, sorry something happens to you mm. now you can kind of slow it down you know the counting to 10 yeah. taking five breaths whatever it is yes take that space before you then make a decision rather than just snap yes. uh, i think that that's a, a big part of it yeah. and, and also as a manager if you can do that if you can keep yourself calm when people other people are mm. kind of all around around you know you can have a much better impact i, I use something called the dialogue model which i, I think i've explained to you in the past where you know when we're talking and we're throwing information into a pool, if, if one of the persons or people in, in red brain in that conversation and then another one becomes there, you get an argument. You've got two people that are just not listening to each other, yes. angry. And so that that leads to bad things, right? When, when we have poor relationships or, or poor interactions, mm. it leads to poor relationships. And that's mm. the part I was saying with the really red managers. That's kind of what they get because they yell at people, yeah. aggressive People feel intimidated, and they, if, if they're not intimidated, they come out swinging. So they have an argument with the boss, and they're yeah. like, "Oh, you know, this guy's—he's a hothead and all that kind of stuff." But you know, you're creating that environment. Yes. And so, um, a big part of, of, you know, is about creating that space where they're thinking, but also yeah. them understanding the impact they have on their people around them and, and the people yeah. that work for them. So that—that that to me is probably the two that um, you know, if, if they can just calm themselves down in the in the moment. So hang on, let's just work this out. Why is Clint angry at me mm. then? How can I calm him down? Because if I'm if I'm thinking that way, I'm already calming myself down because I'm using yeah. a different part of the brain that's yeah. not getting me into red. It's actually taking me to blue and I'm thinking solutions. And yeah. I'm now trying to change him to focus to something else. And that's kind of the key piece around that. The future orientation. And it's um, topical at the moment, obviously, with uh, COVID-19, but the underlying principles are the same and... At the moment, um, obviously, the situation has created a lot of uncertainty um, for a lot of people and uh, for people who typically get anxious, you know, um, worry about undesirable future outcomes is something that ruminates um, with them. At yep. the moment, it's COVID and it's a big one. It's created uncertainty, but, you know, throughout our lives, there's a whole range of other things that create that uncertainty. 
Yep. Um, what's one practical tool um, that you sort of bring to life in the book that um, really helps uh, people who um, don't deal well with uncertainty and as a result it creates anxiousness and then all the fallen effects from that? Yeah, look, um, one of the best things I've read over the years was um, one of um, Tony Robbins' books. He had a, a chapter just on questions. Mm -hmm. And um, I've used that a lot in the past where people who are struggling with stuff, whatever that may be, is to let them just do a thoughts diary. Yeah. Start thinking about, because it does a couple of things. One is it actually calms you down because you're using your analysis part of your brain yes. rather than the worrying part. So it kind of interrupts what you're thinking because if you're thinking something that's kind of negative, you know, oh, you know, what's going to happen? I've lost my job or whatever. And you can't stop that. We, we can't change that particular thing. Obviously, we can mm. what else we can do. And so, again, it's always about trying to change the focus to something that's a bit more, I'm not saying... You know, there's this positive psychology stuff out there, but it's not just about saying, oh, you know, everything will be great because it, yes. it do something to make that happen. So part of it is about doing the thoughts diary. So at least you're analysing your thoughts. And then we start to go, you know, as you do that a few days or whatever, it's really important to actually realise what am I thinking? This is my sub subconscious, my unconscious, yes. throwing these thoughts up. And then you can kind of be deliberate about mm. what happens take control of your subconscious and you know i use it as the old rod tidwell example from jerry Maguire, where you know all my hopes are pinned on on rod to do well if he, yes. if he doesn't do yeah. well i'm not going to do well right yeah. so i guess you can look at your unconscious in, in that way and say well you know come on i need you to get out there yeah. and, yeah. and do all the right things and 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 that kind of stuff but i'm actually active part of making that happen yeah. um and so i guess that, that that to me is, is is a key piece around you know just being actually deliberate about how you think, what your thinking's like, and then say, go, well, is that how I really want to think? Because you can take control, right? It's that horse that's out of control, but you can yes. turn it in and take control. It can lead you down a great place. It can lead yeah. you down a bad place. We want to kind of direct yeah. it a bit. Um, and, and there's a part, obviously, in the book where I talk about, you know, being your own director. You can mm. kind of play the movie over and go, right, this isn't working for me. I need to do something else because, you know, if yes. you stay in one place, nothing's going to change. So it's it's about catching yourself in how you think and yeah. saying, I don't have to do that. I can be deliberate about changing that thought process or, or whatever yes. I can do and, and then kind of look at solutions. Whereas if you're stuck, you tend to just look at the problem and nothing else. Yes. Well, as a footnote, I think we need to um, say if anyone who's not old enough to have seen it, um, you need to watch Jerry Maguire. It's a good one. <laughs> Sure. Um, second of all, um, so how do you, if, if there's just one or two questions um, that you ask people that start some future orientated, I mean, I think if you, if you um, look too um, proximal to where at the moment they can't entertain possibility, yep. um, is, there, is there a couple of ways that, um, or specific questions or thought experiments that you set up that actually um, allow someone to not be paralysed by their, their fear and anxiety in the moment and actually start to entertain a future state um, that entertains other possibilities? Yeah, look, I think when you ask them to ask questions of themselves, like, you know, what is it that you'd like to... And it's, it's a, I guess it's just a normal goal-setting kind of approach where mm -hmm. you start to say, well, talk to me about what you actually want to see out of whatever the process yeah. is. If they come to me and I'm working with them on, you know, how they... Um, dealing with a physical injury we, we yes. really focus on um i don't give them advice on it mm. I, I really want them to like the proper coaching approach where i'm asking them heaps of questions about mm. okay so talk to me about what are the things that you're still doing now because um, yes. a lot of times they focus on oh, well i can't play football anymore because my legs no good or whatever yes. um so we, we really focus on you know what what's the What's the good stuff that's still, mm. you know, what's, what other things have you, have you always thought about doing or, you know, what, what do you enjoy? What's, mm. um, and again, it's about them just going into their heads a little bit about, the, the other one is also saying, well, what, what actual good comes out of this situation? Talk to me about some of the good things that, that has come out. Well, you know, I spend more time with the family, I guess, because I yes. can't go anywhere. I'm not playing footy on the weekends. And so, yeah. you, you, again, it's, it's about moving that, shifting that approach to, well, there's a positive. So you're doing that. What are you doing anything else with the kids? And then I guess yeah. it always just leads down. Of, I'm, I'm always trying to steer their thinking to that future part. And, and I guess depending on who's in front of you, you know, there's different ways to kind of get that yeah. out. Sometimes it's really tough when you get a person that really doesn't like talking. That's yes. probably the hardest ones. Yes. Um, but, the, but most of them are pretty good. Like, you know, people don't want to be in those states. That was yeah. idea. I really enjoy being anxious or depressed or feeling bad. Yeah. Um, 
So you kind of ask them those questions that get mm. them, well, what, what do you need to do to get out of this? You've thought your way into this. You know, you've yeah. got to kind of think your way out of it a little bit, you know. So, um, yeah, they're, they're kind of some of the techniques that, that I've used. And what's the, uh, if we go further upstream, we're sort of, I guess, under underlying assumption, the conversation is talking about adults in, in, the, in a workplace or situation. If, you, if we're going upstream and we're talking more about um, pre-adolescence and adolescence, what's the one tool that you think this book would give parents um, in dealing with, um, you know, their son or daughter in that uh, period of their life that if they implemented would really help set them up to success further down the track? Yeah, look, I'm a firm believer in that dialogue model. I think, um, and it's two two reasons for it, because, you know, we're not islands. We all interact with people and, and you know, 99% of people genuinely have relationships and want good relationships yeah. and that kind of stuff. And that comes from talking to each other and, and how we interact and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. One of the great things about the dialogue model, it actually came out of a book called, um, oh, God, I've got it in there, uh, uh, something about, Difficult conversations and how to have them. Yes. Um, crucial conversations, how to have yes. them. Yeah. Anyway, um, one of the things those same guys that wrote that book also had a um, a paper where it, it, talk, it was called "Silence Kills," and it goes through when people have good conversations. So this is in the workplace in, in healthcare, and um, it goes through a number of things around how the people that are able to have good conversations, even when it's hard to do, um, when they feel like oh, if it can go really badly. Um, the ones that can do that really well seem to have a better result. They're happier people. They have better relationships and all that stuff. So if you rewind all the way back, you're a young kid. Mm. You know, if you've got an undercurrent of that, I'm too scared to have this conversation and I don't, I'll just keep, kind of avoid everything, yes. you're, gonna, you're, you're more likely to have a problem in the future. Yeah. And yeah. if you're a really aggressive person and you just come at everybody and go, oh, I don't want to talk to Clint. He's always angry. He's a pain in the ass, right? So then you're also like, and again, it all pans out in that workforce stuff I was talking about with human yeah. statistics as well. So I think the key in the book, I really focus quite a bit on if schools were going to do something, especially early on with young kids, mm. and they build their ability to not only feel comfortable, or sorry, be okay with feeling a little uncomfortable, but still having a conversation that needs to be had yes. and, and, and doing a bit of a calibration. If you treat me badly and I'm a kid, I'm allowed to say to you, hey, Matt, you know, I really didn't like the way you did that. You might not have known that you've done that to annoy me. But, you know, and I think there needs to be more of that kind of structured yeah. um, conversations that need to happen and yeah. more regularly. So, so kids get used to it. They Because then, you know, as they get older, they've got that skill set yes. and they can deal with it as, as it happens. And, you know, you can see people that, um, like over time when, when I've worked in the police, I've kind of had a bit of that ability to kind of talk people down. And yes. I think, you know, as a cop for nearly seven years, I've only ever really been involved in like two absolute fights where it's on and, you know, there's, mm -hmm. it's just the way it is kind of thing. Yes. And mm -hmm. most of the time I'm able to talk people down and, and kind of calm them down. And, you know, that was some of the stuff that we did do with the police um, trying to do that tactical disengagement. Like, you know, 15, 20 years ago, they would just go back, kick the door in, five people get injured, they get mm -hmm. injured. Whereas now they, they wait a little bit, they calm down and make sure that, you know, and so there's different approaches around doing that stuff. So I think, you know, that those things are important. Yeah, I, th I think that's a really great um, take home and probably um, even more so uh, important at the moment for parents who most of them have got their kids at home, right? <laughs> so they're not at school. So, you know, parents have this amazing opportunity in this um, in this period um, to start to you know, have these conversations with their kids and get them talking about how they're feeling and, and rationalising and, and using it as an opportunity, I guess, to have these crucial conversations to set them up for success down the track. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. And okay. um, proximity too, you know, um, you talk to people, people that you become friends with at work, these are the ones that are the closest in proximity to you. Mm call that um whether you know and that's kind of the same now you've got them at home there's a good opportunity to really yeah. kind of educate them and, on some stuff and, and that kind of thing as well yes all right well clint you are always very generous with your time and um this, this take two um <laughs> has been just as uh, enjoyable and insightful uh, the second time around um for those who uh, want to buy the book and they should um sure. where's it where's the best way place for them to go to get it so um, you can get it online at the moment. I know that uh, they sold out on Amazon 
which is a good sign. But yeah, um, right. you could just Google Clint Adams lighting the blue flame. There's a few different places. I see uh, Dimex has got it. There's a few others, uh, Booktopia and those kinds of ones. So if you just Google the name, um, yeah. it should come up. But yeah, lighting the blue flame and that's got kind of the blue, blue flame. Yeah. I personally downloaded it uh, from Amazon um, and, for the, uh, and read it on the computer. So that was okay. also a, a really great way to, um, to get it as well. Yeah, well, it's probably a bit quicker with uh, what's going on. <laughs> I don't know. Absolutely. It took about a month. Absolutely. Um, is there any other places other than uh, the website um, that you wanted to direct people to um, if they want to find out any more information? Um, no, there's probably, I mean... Uh, I've done a few things on my Facebook page. I've got something yeah. called uh, the Blue Flame Project, which has got a fair bit of content. I did an ebook, yes. uh, which is part of this book, which is about helping people in general. Um, and, and that ebook's available free through that part yeah. of, on my Facebook page. Yeah. So, yeah, that's probably the only ones at this point. You know, I can't do a proper book launch. Um, <laughs> but I think I put on there that, you know, I'd have to remarry my wife so I get two people <laughs> or, or kill someone and get 10 people there. So, yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. With what's going on. But look, I, I'm sure once this all dies down, I'll do a proper book launch yeah. and we'll kind of get some website stuff up and running. I am working on some videos at the moment yes. with another person, uh, which I'll put some stuff out. And once I've got the links for that, I'll, I can flick that to you and okay. with this um, interview on, we can uh, add to that as well. Excellent. Well, you uh, should check it out and buy the book. Um, if you've got any questions or you can see some value of um, working with Clint, definitely reach out. He's very generous and very passionate. So um, thanks again for your time, Clint, and uh, thanks, can't man. wait to uh, see what you do next. Awesome. Appreciate your time. Thank you. Anytime. Thanks, Clint. Yeah, well, Cheers. Bye.